Welcome back to the workshop and welcome to this solar monitor project. So those of you who've been following along, you'll know uh, it's been a long, arduous journey and we started at uh, Breadboard, trying to work out some kind of system that will work, explored lots of avenues, lots of dead ends. Uh, then we progressed onto Vero board and then decided, you know, time is now to go and get something commercially made. So I put an order in with JLC PCB and we got the first prototype boards back. And that was the system that we touched on in the last video. Yeah, we showed proof of concept, showed some data, and we showed that, yeah, it did actually work. Uh, regular viewers of this channel will also know that, you know, this worked pretty well, but we always ask ourselves the question, can it be improved? And the answer is yes. And that is over there. But before we get to that, let's dive into this in a little bit more detail. Okay, so because this is an electrical project, just a couple of things just to make clear. This is only using very low voltages. So I'm using five volts DC for the Hall effect sensors, five volts DC for the Arduino Nano, and I've got 12 volts AC uh, to control the Harvey. I'm not going anywhere near the high voltage DC for the PV or the batteries. Uh, second thing is, this is just, it's not meant to be a tutorial. It's not a guide. This is just a documentation of me building this project and uh, just for a bit of entertainment for you to follow along at home. Okay, so with that being said, uh, kick back and uh, let's enjoy the video. So we'll just switch it on and you can see it boot up. Now, not everything's connected. As you see, I don't have the Harvey connected. I did have this on the system as well, so I had two Harveys. But as the one would be in the system and it would be providing power and I'd be messing about on the bench and, and then the other one was on as well, it got very confusing. At one point, I basically had to uh, reset the hub uh, back to factory default and then reflash to the firmware on there um, and then um, reconnect repair one of these so the one I've got live is the one working on the system now I know these screens don't show up that well on camera so we'll just do my best there so it's booting up it zeroes the sensors and then these values here 500 and something 512 is the Arduino units and that's measuring uh, the Hall effect sensor that's in these two here these are the homemade a little CT clamps, see the Hall effect in there, it's 49E, takes 0, 5 volts and a signal and when there's no current passing through there, which is what you've got now, um, they give out 2.5 volts and then when the current goes one way they go towards 4 and when it goes the other way go down towards 1, so they're always positive and because this is converted into Arduino units it's reading that as 512 in the middle all the way up to 1023 and down to 0. So that's just showing that's okay. And then hopefully you can see on the screen there, uh, it's telling you the kilowatts through the PV, which would be one of these and the battery, the other one. Um, obviously there's nothing flowing through there at the moment, but that's what you get when it all turns on. Right, at this point, uh, you can do a few things with it. So one is you can go into the menu and it's you can enter some of the calibration for some of the features and some of the curve compensation. We'll show you that in a minute. Uh, the other thing you can do just from this main screen is just go down one. And that takes you kind of behind the scenes, debugging or a little bit more technical information. So here you've got uh, the kilowatts from the panels, uh, what the current is, and then this is um, a value you put in yourself, a voltage you put in. So it's basically zero at the moment. You can go down one more and it goes a little bit deeper. And now it's showing you the power and the current. And then the PWM signal, this is the PWM signal that goes uh, just about in shot, yeah, to the LED that joins up to the LDR. So you can see how many pulses you're putting out and see if it's in line with expectation. Just sort of see what it's doing, really. Go down one more. Now, same thing for the battery. How many kilowatts, how many amps, and then what the volts would be. So basically, um, when it's running live and you've got a signal, it'll be multiplying the volts that you've told it as a fixed value. Obviously, it's not reading that. It's just a fixed value. Also, by the current, it calculates through the DC sensor and that turns into watts or kilowatts, however you want to view it. So that's how that works. And then we go into the next screen, same again. You got your kilowatts and your amps uh, that are running through from the battery in this case, and then what the PWM signal it's putting out in a closed loop sense based on the calculations. And then that just goes out through here. It varies the resistance um, in the AC side of the circuit. We'll get into that in a minute and sends it out to the Harvey, but that's essentially what you got. And you go back to the beginning, and there you go back to your main menu where you've just got your panels and battery power and then the voltage that you've told it 
which is the voltage of your system. So the other thing you can do then, you've got this button here, which is the menu button, you can go into there. And then this is where you can tell it the sensitivity of the sensor. So this is the CT clamp for the current for the photovoltaic panels. And if you look at the factory value, I think it was 0.625 uh, volts per amp or something like that. Obviously we need to invert that because we want amps per volt and that's nominally 48. Um, if we have time in this video, we'll talk a little bit more about whether you really should go for 48 or put a slightly different value in, but we'll, as we'll touch on that a bit later. So that is a factory calibration for the sensor, it's for the um, PV, if we go to the next one, same for the battery one, uh, next one, oh and you can go, you can go either way, so you can go back there, back to the battery, you know, jump through the settings. So we were there, same for that one, right. Next one is, uh, this is where you tell it, the what I've called here the average volts, and that's because if you've got two strings, uh, the way this would work, because they're in series, in my case, if you've got two strings in series, I should say, uh, this is the average of that. So if one's a bit higher, one's a bit lower, you pick the average, and then the maths will still work because you're putting the CT clamp around both those strings and the positive cables that go into the inverter. Anyway, that's the average volts of my uh, panels that I've got, and then the next one, I'm sure you can guess, I says average volts, but I guess that isn't really true anymore. That's just the voltage uh, from the battery pack. Typically, you know, it, it does vary a bit, but it's typically there. Same with the panels. Once the sun's come out, it's bright enough and it's got sort of 85% of the voltage, then the current starts flowing. So this is the, the region uh, where you'd put that value in there. So that's the battery. All right, next one gets a little bit more complicated. So if we go into that. Uh, you might remember from the last video we were looking at uh, the curve fitting and the second order polynomial curve fit that it did. Um, and there were two uh, factors in there in that equation that you could edit. Well, these are those two things. So because this is running open loop, um, the current goes in here, runs a load of calculations based on the current that it sees. And then it just puts uh, a PWM signal out here, which varies the resistance, which varies the current. And it doesn't know if it's got the right answer. It's just a lookup equation, if you like. And here's um, where you can actually change those variables and fine tune it because these components are variable. These are handmade, the LED LDR combination. A range of factors means that you do need to dial it in a little bit with this system. So this is the first parameter, the exponential boost. So the X squared a value, if you like, that's so it's, the 49 is a little bit arbitrary, but it's 49 times a small multiplier that's used for that calculation. So it allows you to put some very um, fine tuned steps in there, if you like. Um, same thing on the battery, you'll notice that's negative because it's, it's put a nominal kind of characteristic for the system in, just a typical characteristic. And then to actually tune it in, uh, this is what it needed on the battery, on the battery circuit. No particular reason for that, it's just the tolerances in the components and the way this has been put together needed that fine tune. Um, and then there's a linear part of that second order polynomial. So there's a squared term and then there's a linear part and then there's a constant at the end. And again, you can tune that. The 28 is a bit arbitrary, but it's 28 multiples of some small value and it multiplies those together. Again, gives you a little bit more fidelity on tuning it in. And then the same thing for the battery, although in this case it was zero. Um, come on, the last one was, oh, I did have a placeholder for AC mains, but actually you don't need that. It doesn't actually come into it, believe it or not. Um, it isn't required in the overall system calibration. Once you know what kilowatts you need to put out, um, all the maths needs to be centered around that. But I've just left it in on this one. And then we're back to the beginning again. So there's our open loop system in terms of its menu functionality. Oh, you can change these by the way. I didn't talk about that, did I? So you can just up and down, change these to whatever you want. And then you just press menu and it comes out again, saves the changes. So you might be wondering where is it saving them to? So I did look into buying an auxiliary EEPROM, EEPROM, however you pronounce it, like a non-volatile memory that you can write to and it uh, retains those values once you turn it off like a memory stick. Um, it turns out, great news, the Nano has got one of those built in. I think it's the chip underneath. There seems to be something that looks like EEPROM type size underneath. Um, anyway, you can store data on there and when you turn the power off, it retains it. So all those settings, calibration, uh, the polynomial factors, everything, voltage, all saved on that memory and reloaded last time. The next time you um, boot it up or do a reset. So that's great. The only thing to say is it, it was only uh, 512 bytes, which sounds like quite a lot. Um, uh, yeah, it is for a little device like that. 
and considering the overall memory it's about the right size all in proportion but it does mean you know you are limited to an extent because if you want to store floating point numbers they need four bytes and so on so you can quickly use them up in my case i've got plenty of space on this open loop version but the more ambitious project off the side which we'll get into later it got a little bit tight and i had to you know work within those limitations if you like but nice to see it's got that and it it stores that in there as well So while we're over this side, I'll just talk about how I got the AC source to be synchronized to the mains voltage. So it's really critical that the current that it's modifying is completely synchronized to the voltage signal going around your house, your AC voltage. So I did start here with this rather dangerous looking device here. So this is a, an adapter. We've got loads of these. I'm sure you've got them around the house as well. Essentially, it takes the mains power in there, 230 volts AC in the UK, and it goes through that transformer. Now at this point, it comes out, step down an amount, depending on the transformer. And uh, this was pretty close to the required voltage I needed to eventually put into the Harvey. Um, so, but it's coming out as AC at this point. Nice thing is it's um, synchronized to the voltage. Now, depending on exactly which way around you connect it, it might be 180 degrees out, but that's fine. We can deal with that. So that's essentially where I started with my AC synchronized source. And I had a look around and actually they're quite rare to get an AC transformer. Most of them are DC. Uh, this one I managed to find. So uh, here we go, so it's obviously mains input there, 240, and the output is 12 volts AC up to two amps, which is, I thought was plenty, but what I definitely didn't want it to do was to, um, if the demand changed something on the resistance for this to kind of bog down and try and catch up, I wanted it to easily be able to put out the current. Obviously you want to be careful how much current you want to be put into that Harvey, because uh, you'll probably damage something if you put uh, more, than, more than, I don't know, a few tens of milliamps, I would guess. Uh, anyway, this, so this is my AC source that goes into the whole system and synchronized to the mains. These are, I think, for powering like laptops or something. They're quite pricey, um, which is odd because there's less in them. There's no, um, where is it? You've got no rectifier and smoothing part. So whereas one of these, I don't know, is about seven pounds. This is about 19. So I guess it's a volumes thing. There's less in it and it costs like two or three times the price. Anyway, uh, I also ended up with two of these, so you know, you'll bear that in mind with the cost of this whole project. Anyway, that's the AC input. And so hopefully it's a little bit clearer in case there's any doubt about how it all works. Um, just in case, let's just talk you through it. We've got our DC CT clamps here and they're varying the voltage away from 2.5 volts. There's some smoothing going on there. You do need some filtering, particularly on the battery one, because I, I guess there's some DC DC converter in the DC DC converter inside the inverter um, that's put some ripple and some noise on it, and that will be seen as an actual signal, and this thing would just go bananas. So um, it did need a reasonable amount of filtering. I think the 100 uh, microfarad in the end, something like that, um, and a low pass of a couple of hertz. Can't quite remember where I settled. Um, the, these bits were on the original, there was the ability to zero it and some fine tuning the zero uh, or even putting the voltage in I think actually. I've long since gone away from that, it's all done in software as you can see so I didn't need that really anymore but um, they're on the board. Um, obviously we've got, yeah so then it goes into the nano, it has a look at that current, it checks the voltage that you've told it that that should also be multiplied by gets the kilowatts, runs all the equations for the sensitivity of these, puts out a PWM, which varies the brightness of the LED, and then completely separate on this side, I've got my 12 volts AC coming in here. Now I really wanted something that was 5 volts AC because this is what the Harvey wants, or for my testing it seems to want 5 volt AC. Um, but the, seven, uh, the 12 volts was all I could get, so I'm going to have to step that down using a pair of um, voltage dividers. Don't like doing that, but yeah, that's what we ended up with. And because these are very low value, to make sure there's enough current coming through and actually get a signal on here when it harvests, um, they do get warm, so I ended up with the one watt versions. You know, you can easily touch them, but you can tell they're warm. But it does it does still work. Um, and then we're teeing off the middle of that to get us to somewhere around five volts AC. And that is what we are then varying with this LDR on this side, like dependent resistor controlled by the LED. And then that goes out to the Harvey, the plus and minus, or the two sensors, if you want, out there. Same thing on the battery. The only thing on the battery, as I said in the last video, there's a du dual pole, dual switch, dual pole, dual throw 
uh, relay in there. So it's basically taking the two plus and minus or one and two, whatever you want to think, and turning them like that to get the 180 degrees for when it notices the current's going the other way for the battery, if it's charging or discharging, it'll trip that relay on and off and that will swap it over. What that does is it flips the current round 180 when it multiplied by the voltage, it realizes it's out of phase, so on the app it shows charging or discharging. Hopefully that may, yeah, that, that hopefully is really straightforward. And that's kind of it in the functionality. The rest of it was down to the software tuning, which was, yeah, quite an adventure. I'm getting it all to work. You know, in theory, it's all easy, but yeah, the implementation turned out to be quite lengthy. Um, and the last thing just to talk about is what we then did from here. So I think I've already mentioned that um, I, I didn't use these in the end. I'm not using these parts or these zeros. So um, also I decided it'd be quite nice to add a screen and some keyboard functionality. So at least I could see what's going on and help debug it. But as I did that and added that functionality, I realized actually that's quite nice to have just to see, you know, just a glance what's it doing before you even connect it to a Harvey. Um, so I worked on that and developed that. Now, the only thing to be aware of, so the very, very early system was based on an Uno and the Uno's got a lot more ins and outs and it's also got a dedicated I2C. I'm gonna call it a bus. I don't know if it's technically really a bus, but um, it's a serial interface anyway, and you've got a clock and a data line there, and they are separate on these pins. So that's great, and that's that meant I could use all the uh, all the analog ins and outs from A0 to A5 for buttons and resets and whatnot. Um, now, unfortunately, I forget which one it was, but the A4 and A5 were used by something else on this. And on the Nano, the A4 and A5 are uh, what you need for your data and clock signals because it doesn't have a dedicated, you know, because it's quite small. And I'd use them for something else, so I don't know if you can see, it's probably not, but I ended up drilling little holes to drill out the tracks and make sure the A4 and A5 were then dedicated um, to run the I, I squared C network to then um, hook up to a LCD display. I didn't have to do that for the keypad because the way this one works is it's just got a series of resistors and when you push a button, it just gives you a voltage between zero, five, or some you know, steps in between, like uh, one volt, two, three, four. I don't think it was as simple as that, but you, know, you get the idea. As long as the voltage is in a certain range, it knows you press that button. Quite simple. And then it can go into just one of the analog ports. So nice and simple, straightforward, and worked really well. I found if you push it really, really quickly like that, it can get a bit upset. And um, I think you've exit the menu where in fact you just pushed a different key multiple times. But yeah, that aside, it's, it works really well. So um, because of all that, to get that functionality in, hopefully I can turn it over without... Yeah, it ended up being having quite a lot of wires and mods and things. Now it does work, but if you bump it too much, you can get it to drop out. So it wasn't ideal, but again, proof of concept. But yeah, kind of like that. Um, so I think the I think the data and clock are going out of sync and they never get back in sync unless you reboot it is my experience of that. Yeah, wigging and wires, whatever, doesn't doesn't really work. Let's just try it live actually. What happens if I just cycle the power on here? Does that bring you back into sync? No, I think it's lost the ultimate connection and it's just gone out of sync on the clock. Yeah, yeah, dodgy wires, it's not ideal, is it? So we need to um I guess this is a very, very good segue into could it be improved? Yes, let's go on to that. Okay, one last thing to talk about on those boards. Um, obviously, that's a professional looking board there. So this is the one I had made up uh, through JLC PCB. So I've used similar packages in the past, but not this actual one. So I used Easy EDA in the end because it had a nice link to, to this company. There's other similar you know, sort of deals and packages available. That's the one I went for. Um, and then they sent this within a week, dropped through the letterbox, and we had um, five boards made up, all like this. And these are the components they were happy to solder on using the pick and place machines. As you can see, not all of them, especially the through components, they, they want you to do that. I can get kind of see why. So we have one board that was made up there, and then I've obviously modified that since. Uh, there's three here, one which I've heavily uh, borrowed, 
some of the components for, um, and they went onto the next board. And then I think it was an e intermediate board as well that I used to try and get to that next step that I wanted to get to. So um, not sponsor or anything, but a really great service within a week just came back. Um, not super cheap, but, but if you consider everything they're doing um, and what you're getting for all your money, I guess you could say pretty good value, actually. I was pretty happy with that. I think the boards worked out about £20 each, but then there was shipping which was quite a lot and VAT and things like that so it's just under a hundred pound for five boards and as you've seen um, I've had to make modifications so yeah it's part of the development isn't it right let's go on to the next stage so the next stage ends up looking like this um, obviously it's even more heavily modified than before lots of wires that are almost touching because they're very very close together and tape to try and stop things you know getting punctured through from the sharp pins uh so what are we doing here well on the last system over there this one just out of shot um this was open loop so signal comes in um uh, has a not a lookup table but it runs some algorithms and it just produces an output and it's no idea what it's if it's right or not this one is closed loop and so what this one is doing well, there's quite a few improvements on this if you like uh, but what this is doing is um, it's got a, a shunt resistor here and it's sent and this is in the AC part of the circuit it's only 10 ohms or something like that um, and it's sensing across there using this little ADC we'll get into that in a minute but so it's checking what it puts out and then it's coming back around and going okay did I get it right and adjusting kind of as the principle in the way I enacted it um, for technical reasons we'll get into in a minute I've had to do it a bit differently to that, but it is a closed loop system so it can learn and it can put out the correct signal. So we'll show you the data in a minute and uh, you can decide for yourself if you think it's a, a step up or not. Um, also on this board, yeah, it's because I'm no longer using these, so I didn't need that in, a, in the end. And I've had to just about kind of shoehorn the ADC in here above the relay. It wasn't ideal. Um, also, you'll see on the LED, I've got in series that a resistor. Now, the idea of that is, let's just talk about that for a minute. So one of the issues with this one, or issues or limitations, if you like, is you can only put whole numbers of PWM out. You can't put half a PWM. You can have one, two, three, all the way up to 255, and the LED gets brighter. Now, it turns out, just as, you know, as these things are, um, in terms of the resistance you need, if you put 255 out, that is way too high uh, a brightness and the resistance is way too low and that would be equivalent to, I don't know, it's like 15 kilowatts or something. Um, so way too much. Effectively, um, going up to the six kilowatts I need, we were only putting like one to 30 PWM out. So that was my range. So you were losing all that fidelity, the ability to go up to 255. And I thought of loads of different ways of doing this, having multiple ones in series to try and bring the resistance down and then having um, ha having to put more PWM in some way of expanding that range. And then I had the idea, well, just put a resistor in series with the LED and then you need more PWMs for the same resistance and you effectively expand that range out. So on the original prototype before I did this, I had a variable resistor um, and it works out what was the sweet spot so that it, it used, I think we're going up to about 200 PWM, just to give me a little bit of safety margin in case any of these components vary a bit. Um, so that's what we got. So that's the first mod. And then we'll talk about the A to D or ADC converter here. So this clever little device down here is an ADS 1115. It's an ADC analog to digital converter. Um, pretty high bit rate, yeah, 16 bit, so you know, better than the inputs over here, which I think were 10 bit. What does that mean? Basically, more resolution, really fine detail on your signals. And I did consider putting a few of these and having them as the inputs over here. In the end, um, the, the 10 bit and inputs on this is absolutely fine, so don't need that. But um, it was perfect because um, it's got these four analog channels so you can have four individual channels that you're sampling or what i want to do in my case i want to read across the shunt so i've got these in differential modes so i'm looking at the differential voltage across either side so a0 and a1 are across say the pv1 and a2 and a3 are across the battery shunt resistor so i'm reading the differential voltage because i know that's 10 ohms 
um, then I know what the current is through that system as well. And this is also on, you see the clock and the data, this is on the I squared C network. So same as the LCD screen, they're all on that same bus if you like, and they all get read and they're all connected to four and five, which are the data and the clock. So that's quite nice. And then they all, yeah, they're connected here and the keypad is still connected to analog. I think it was A2 in the end. So that was, uh, yeah, a revelation when I found that and got that to function. It was pretty hard in terms of getting it all to absolutely work. And there's a whole, probably a whole monologue I could give on actually reading the current is in this case, because you've got harvesting in there as well, it's quite complicated. Well, I, I found it to be complicated and to get something that matches what the app is expecting. So there was a lot of time uh, writing the the algorithm that would interpret that signal. Um, and there's another thing we need to get into. So the, those of you familiar with this will probably be thinking, hang on a minute, this can only read positive voltages and you're using it on an AC voltage. Yeah, I ran the numbers on it and it's OK. Let me just sort of explain why. So if you look at the spec sheet for that, it tells you that each of these inputs here normally would be between zero and whatever the voltage you're supplying them with. So I guess in this case, it's going to be about five volts. So um, that's the absolute in each of those pins, not necessarily a differential, but the absolute must stay within zero plus five volts. It does have a kind of um, extreme example, like extreme load case, and it's the zero volts minus 0.3 volts and the 5 volts, in my case, or the supply voltage, plus 0.3. So although that's 0 to 5 volts is where you should put the signals in, it will actually tolerate anything up to 0.3, or 300 millivolts above, and 0.3, 300 millivolts below zero. I ran the numbers on it, and the voltages I'm putting in are really small, because you're talking about milliamps here. You know, on this scale, um, 7, 8 milliamps was 7 or 8 kilowatts, which is plenty. So... Although you can only go between you know, zero and five because there's a little bit of a tolerance for above and below, um, I'm way, way within that. Now, I'll run this for a while and just see what happens. Maybe after an extended running, it will get upset with it. I don't know. Um, but it's been working fine, and I've had a couple of these boards and iterations of them, and they've all been fine from that point of view. The key thing, or the key issue, has been uh, reading the signal from the harvesting and kind of separating that out and figuring out which bit you need to take pay attention to and so on. So yeah, I'm using it with a very slight negative voltage, but it's it's almost zero. It is so small across there that it is actually functioning okay uh, so far. Anyway. So you've probably seen these in the background. These are the evolution of this board because yeah <laughs> that and it was a bit yeah it would work for a bit and then wouldn't and you just touch a wire and it'd be fine again and you, well, yeah okay time for a redesign you can see that there are a lot of things that aren't optimal i've you know put series resistor in there i've got this shoved in wherever it will fit i don't need those i don't need the reset switches um i want to make use of this shunt functionality here and basically just do a better job of just wiring it up and spreading it all out so that's what we've got over there So if we've, I've got five made up now, this time you'll notice that um, there's no components on there at all. That's to try and save some costs, really, because I think all in, five of these boards. So I've got four here, and I've got one made up that's actually running on the system now. Um, they came to, I think we're shipping that, everything, the five boards, around £32, which is a lot cheaper than having them made up. Obviously, you're not getting any components, but a lot of them I had anyway, because I had to buy things in bulk, and I've managed to... Things I showed you earlier and borrow a few components off the the old board and here they are and um, so if we compare and contrast the layout first of all you know everything evolves and gets better and better or hopefully it will do anyway so each of the uh, the maskings a lot a lot nicer now I've got segregated areas um, generally a similar layout but I've improved a lot of things in terms of so let's start I start over here yeah on these capacitors I got the wrong footprint so they ended up being about oops, yeah, about a millimeter apart. Yeah, it's just clearance, and these are low voltages, so it didn't really matter. But wasn't really super happy with that. So now we've got that footprint sorted out. That's fine. We don't have uh, the resets or the potentiometers all done in software, so we don't need that. 
That meant I had space to put the ADS-1115 there, so this one goes here. Um, yeah, we'll get into labeling in a minute. Spread things out a little bit nicer, just a little bit more logical. Now I know what I need. And um, put the shunt resistors in a little bit nicer as well. The other thing I did on this is, you know, you can put as much silk screening on as like, really, it's all in the price. So I made sure I put that in so that when I'm, and also some of the components, so that when I'm making these boards, I know what I'm supposed to put where and don't mess anything up from that point of view. And um, they do silk screen on the back as well. I don't didn't really notice much price increase, if any, that didn't, didn't seem to come out. Um, again, helps with debugging and checking and uh, sort of seeing that you're sorting it together correctly. So I've got a few of those. This is what's made up running on the system live now. Um, however, two areas I messed up in. One is somehow I managed to get this connector completely backwards. So all these, these are the correct connections, but on that board, actually I might be able to show you there. Um, yeah, you can see that matches. You've got five volts at this end and then the A0, A3 at that end. But of course that's the underside. So when you go that way around, yeah, it's backwards. So I ended up soldering the pins coming out the top and flipping the board over and plugging it in from the top on a, on a header. So yeah, okay. <laughs> Not ideal, but works. And then the other error I made is I managed to the clock and the data onto this port. Um, I managed to get those reversed. So initially I fired it all up and it, it didn't work and I didn't know why and tracked it down to that. They're correct down here that goes out to the LCD display, but the clock and the data are backwards there. So on the board, I ended up cutting the tracks and soldering a small wire to get that right again. Apart from that, the new board is a lot better, but <laughs> There's annoying little er errors in it as well. Okay, uh, what else we're going to cover in here? Ah, yes, one more thing. So rather than use the DCCT clamps and trying to put uh, current through and get everything nice and hot and everything like that, um, for testing, as you can see, I've got these. These basically simulate the Hall Effect sensor. And so I've got two buttons. Each one represents a channel. So we've got the solar panels and the battery. And what this is actually doing is, you see there's, there's a pair of each of these. Uh, these are potentiometers. So you got 0 and 5 volts across them, and then in the center tap, uh, this one's the zero, I think, yeah. So you can set the zero point, so when the switch is off, this one's in circuit, and uh, that's to set the zero. And when it's on, this potentiometer comes in circuit, and you put that wherever you want. That might be uh, a value that represents one kilowatt, two, three, and you can turn it with a trim pot to set it. So you can go from zero to whatever kilowatts you want just by switching on, so that was the panels, say or you can switch on the battery and switch it off and it will pick each of the pots. I know it looks a bit, yeah, a bit of wood, but it, it does work. And I did mean to make something nicer, but to be honest, it works. So I haven't. <laughs> uh, so they go into there. That's the only other thing to, think to say on that. Um, yeah, I think everything else, everything else we've covered. Okay, so I guess the big question is, you've gone from open loop to closed loop. Is it any better? What's the performance like? Well, the past couple of days, we haven't had great sunny weather because we're in uh, October now. Um, but I've managed to generate some readings. So as before, we've got time of day on this axis, same here. And we've got the battery at the top and we've got the PV panel generation here. For the battery, the zero is in the middle. So you've got charge and discharge and obviously the panel is all positive. You've just got generation. The two colors in here are both black and unfortunately, uh, we'll bring you in a bit closer and we'll show you the legend and um, what they're what they are is um, what the my energy app is saying with my solar monitor on it like the fake value if you like and then the other line um, is what the fox app was saying so basically we're just trying to compare the two apps one which should be correct and the other one is my one which well let's see how close it is so there's our zero on the battery so the actual value is the little diamond and then the app is the square and in general you can see they follow each other what you can see here though is the uh, yeah on the fox app because it's only every five minutes you've got a value here that's zero another value that's zero and then it jumps up to that value there whereas on the my energy app with my fake value um, because it's every three seconds or so however long it updates um, it immediately jumps up to here because this is around lunchtime and kettles coming on and hob which is electrics coming on and it caught that and then it went that one and then here so effectively they split 
and this one didn't catch up until it got to that point and then they agreed again the same thing around uh, dinner time there same thing happened um, the hob and everything was on for a lot longer so this time the fox app did actually catch up in the end but this is where you get into the well you know which is the real answer which one do you kind of go with and believe or how do you verify the fake value i'm making i'm interpreting that as it's probably okay to be honest uh, on that well, i'm certainly very happy with it uh similar thing with the panels uh, down here uh but yeah so so it wasn't that sunny a day when you got to two kilowatts here and again same trend there is a little bit of a difference we'll get into that in a minute down here um, but yeah, the, the trend is, is there as well. And which one was which? Yeah, so the app, the fake value, is a slightly undercalling the Fox value. And because it was relatively steady, although not a great day, you might argue that that should be a little bit higher. Uh, should we do that now? Let, let me show you the next day. That was a day. Here's another day, day later, in fact. Um, Again, the battery, charge, discharge looks pretty good. I uh, managed to catch them all these this time. And again, the panel's looking pretty good. Or well, certainly, you know, enough to say, what's it doing? It's doing that, doing that, and whatever. So, yeah, let's get on to that difference. Let's go back to this one, because it's probably a little bit worse, isn't it? So I've just made a note down here. You might remember earlier in the video where I was showing you the menu on the uh, open loop version. This is obviously closed loop now. In the open loop version we had a calibration for the sensor now because i i was pretty sure this was going to be a lot more accurate and we'll show you some data about why i thought that in a minute some kind of offline sort of lab test data um what you got to remember is that i'm sensing the current uh that comes from the panels or at the battery end that is before it's gone into the inverter so if i multiply that by the voltage i will get the kilowatts at that point and because I thought this was going to be pretty accurate, what I was a little bit worried about was, well, that goes into the inverter. The inverter has an efficiency with a DC, DC, or the AC to DC, or DC to AC converter, whichever way it's flowing the energy. Um, and I couldn't quite remember what the, the hybrid inverter specs were in the sheet. I've got them somewhere. And so I took a bit of a guess at 94, 95% efficient was what I thought. So rather than putting 48 in, I put 45 you can't put 45.6, which would have been the actual value. And um, it's undercalled it slightly through here. I've then since looked at the value in the efficiency value in the sheet, and they declare 97 minimum, but 40, uh, 97 minimum, but 98 typical. And that means this should have been a little bit higher, which would have closed that gap to being pretty close. Uh, so, yeah, I think... Um, I'll, I'll edit that and I'll change that now. I know the true efficiency and then you know, they're going to be pretty much line on line. That will close up these tiny little gaps as well, I would expect, and just be you know, about there at the top ones as well. So, yeah, I'll do that subtle change, but it kind of says, yeah, you, do you need to take that efficiency into account? You know, if you put 100%, if you put 48 straight in here as a way to compensate for that efficiency... You're not going to be a million miles out even with that, but um, I thought I'd try that and uh, just maybe just gone a little bit far. Anyway, that's that. So the other thing I want to just talk about is, um, yeah, this closed loop calibration and how it all kind of performs uh, upstream of this. Okay, so while we're over here, I thought I'd just show you the calibration routines. This just takes a few minutes to go through, but um, I thought I'd just show you it kind of live. So first thing we need to do is just take these off because it will zero uh, it will read the zero on these and also they need to be not running to get a true zero uh, obviously the, the values have dropped right down so uh, we'll do a reset and um, all we need to do when when it's uh, booting up I'll just hold down the menu button and it will go into the factory reset mode so uh, I think we're all ready to go yep let's do that Then I'll let go. That's going through the calibration. Now we can actually see this live. So what it's going to do, it's going to try and find the value that um, is represented by 0.2 kilowatts and it's found it at 4 PWM. So it's kind of interpolating the PWM until it gets the current that's associated with the next value. So I'm going up in 0.2s, 0.2 kilowatts. 
So it's found the current associated with that and the PWM that's needed to create that. And what we can actually do, I'm just firing up my phone app. So because it's doing it live, it's obviously got to have the Harvey in circuit. It's including the pulsing and yeah, you can see it's going as well. So as it's going through these steps and recording the PWM value needed, you will actually get an output on here. Obviously this is fake now because this is what the system's doing. So there we are, 0.6. And we'll see once it's found that. Okay, so that's got 0.7, so obviously that's obviously climbing up there to find the next one. Yeah, 0 0.8. So we're slightly out because this is um, iterating to find the right answer. Uh, the battery's obviously just got a bit of residual there, 0 0.9. It'll go all the way through. So once it's done that, it'll do the same thing with the battery and then it'll store them in memory. So I'll end up with something like this. So down the bottom here, we've got the kilowatts. Every 0.2 is what I've asked for. And it's going to write down or store in the memory what the PWM value was. And for one of these is the PV and the other one is the battery. And you'll see that because I think I mentioned earlier in the video, there's a little bit of a tolerance on there, um, minus 5% on the current and plus 10%, it can sometimes find the correct value uh, within that range and you get this slight um, ripple in effect here. As I also showed earlier, you can then go back into the menu and because I've got second order polynomial curve fit, you can actually manually tweak this up. I don't think it really really makes any difference on the final output because it's so close, but yeah, it gives it that option. So let's see how it's doing. Okay, so it's got to 1.4. So I'll just leave it running for a bit and um, We'll just show you when once it gets right to the end. So we're just getting near the end now of the PV calibration. So I've asked for every point two, which I think is a reasonable step. And on my system goes to six kilowatts, six kilowatt inverter, so it goes all the way up to there. You can see I'm making pretty good use of the range. So maximum you can have is 255. I think that's finished. It went for about 200, and then it will repeat on the battery. Again, you can see the LED for that one now starting to come on. So point two, it's found that one. You, you see you're only at one PWM, so you're really going to struggle with fine detail at the low end. I guess I could do work and improve that end, but it's I'm pretty happy with it. I think it's good. If there's not much going on in kilowatts, then mm. arguably you're not so worried about that. Yes, it's found these quite easily. And I tend to find that um, at the higher kilowatts, it finds them a lot quicker. I think it's to do with the harvesting and the um, output rate of this. We'll see if you've got a nice strong signal. It's a lot easier to, when it runs to the algorithm that I wrote that tries to interpret the true milliamps that you're getting out of that signal because you've got the harvesting kind of mixed in with the, the pure part of the signal as well, or the bit you want. Uh, again, we'll come back in a minute uh, when it's jumped through all these, but it's essentially doing the same thing as I just showed you. Uh, except now it's running up the battery curve and because of the tolerances in the components it's actually slightly different number of PWMs for the same amount of kilowatts um, but anyway that's what that's doing and again as before because it's live it's actually come out the Harvey it's going onto the server etc and come back down to the app and uh, yeah you can see 2.2 2.4 so obviously this is a fake value I think it's caught up now 2.4 you can just see it it'll just track along one of the nice ways just to prove to yourself that this is actually working because you can't control the sun so you got to sort of run these artificial signals and make sure at least that works and then when it gets to the end the last thing it'll do it'll just check the voltage that it sees on here because these are not uh, not connected the CT clamps are not connected to the cable so it says okay this is what uh, zero current looks like in terms of voltage so it'll be somewhere around 2.5 but it tries to get an exact value for that so you'll see when this gets to six, uh, you'll see um, it run the calibration on all the checks. Or it notes down what the zero is, and then when it's running live, it always subtracts that amount, so that's the true uh, level of current. So here we go. You see the PWM is a lot lower on this side. Just it's just different sensitivities in the components. There we go. Saving the calibrations into the table, into the EEPROM. It's actually very quick, but I deliberately. Um, Add a little delay in there just so you get the sense it's doing something. Okay, it's just checking there, okay, and then we're good. Right, so let's put the panel one on and we'll see that number jump up. 
Okay, just make sure I get it around the pluses on both strings, so they're the minuses at the back, so I just want it round string one, string two, positive only, and it will take those both into account, and getting the direction correct as well, so that's, hopefully you can just about see that, but it's come to 2.4, and then the battery, similar idea, so just try not to block the view. Oh, there's nothing on the battery, is there? Nothing happening. And now I'm now reading, I was jumping around 2.8, 2.7. Okay, we've got a little bit of sunshine, so I thought I'd give you an example here. So, sort of 3.5 kilowatts from the panels, nothing from the battery. And that's flashing, there we go, it's flashing every now and again, it's sending the signals out. So, let's have a look, 3.4, 3.5. Three point three six on there. It's jumping around quite a lot. Three point three. Three point three two. Back to there. Three point four. Okay, so pretty close, but it's jump around, so it's trying to keep up. And then on the my energy, we have got three point three. Okay, I think there's a little bit of a moving average going on here, so there's a slight delay. But three point three against three point three three point four. Uh, pretty good and then there's a little bit of residual from the battery uh, it's, it's barely barely anything at all uh, so there's a quick example and we can go into here also and just look at the uh, PWMs so for that level of kilowatts 3.4 is having to put out PWM value of 74 so 74 you can kind of see it there it's reasonably bright and that's going so that's like a telltale to show you the brightness of the LED inside there. And then that's shining on the LDR and varying the resistance. So it gives you a little bit of a monitor about what's going on. Battery's obviously doing nothing at the moment. Let me cycle back around. Drop. It was at three. No, it's, oh, it's dropping right down. The cloud must be going over. So let's have a look and see how long it takes to catch up. It's 1.7. Oh, 1.9. It's getting there. Oh. And there's a drawer on the house, so it's pulling out the battery, so that's gone up. Okay, 1.4, 1.5, 1.2. This is the problem, things change so quickly. Um, yeah, This is reasonably quick too, because it's instantly calculating. There's a slight delay here. Even worse, if we go into the Fox app, it'll be an even bigger delay. Goodness, you've seen how much it's changed just in the last couple of minutes. So the Fox app will probably be even worse. Let me just fire that up and we'll have a look. There's an equivalent. So just have to log in. All right. So we've got 2.8 coming out the panels on the Fox app, and there you can see it changing real time on the display on the right, but on the left, nope. It'll stay like that for quite a while. There we are on the. And there it is, all back together and all installed. And uh, yeah, we're getting DC on the My Energy app. Little green lights flickering away. And we're getting some indications of power on there as well. And they also happen to match that value there. So, could it be improved? Well, maybe, but <laughs> I think we're going to stop there. So. Thank you very much for watching, hope you enjoyed the series and uh, we'll see you in the next episode.